Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar hosted by Citra Systems Inc. on the subject of compounding pharmacies and clean rooms within healthcare facilities. My colleague Bryce Knudsen will be presenting throughout the, the webinar, and we will allocate 10 to 15 minutes for questions at the end of the webinar. In a couple of seconds, I'll be handing over to Bryce so that you can begin. Bryce, handing over to you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Bryce Newton. I'm a product manager at Cetra Systems. I'm the product manager for critical environments with an emphasis on healthcare. So today we're going to talk about uh, understanding compounding pharmacies and clean room facilities within a hospital with an emphasis on regulation and um, standards. As I noted, uh, I uh, kind of introduced myself. Uh, Rabia has already introduced himself and he's our regional sales manager. So you can all reach out to him for further questions as well. And we also have with us Patrick McGee. He's uh, my co product manager for critical environments with an emphasis on clean rooms and other life science specific applications. So let's talk just real quick, kind of high level, what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, this webinar is going to concentrate on air quality and air, mon like air quality monitoring aspects of compounding pharmacies and clean rooms. Um, just to be clear, things we're not gonna talk about, we're not gonna get into telling you you know, how to define what type of CSPs you have or what hazard risk your uh, compounded drugs are. That's not the, the goal here, but uh, those, those will be mentioned as part of this due to how you define air quality requirements and monitoring requirements for your clean rooms. So we'll start with uh, just a quick overview of clean room spaces in the hospital. Uh, then we'll talk through the common standards and accreditations and certifications related to that. We'll then dig pretty deep into requirements and best practices for monitoring air quality. We have a couple examples to talk through and then we'll actually uh, present a couple of solutions from Cetra. Um, just a note, uh, everything discussed here uh, the opinions, the information, they're, they're not implied and do not re represent the views or opinions of ASHRAE, ISO, or USP. All right, so why do we have clean rooms in hospitals? Well, first is to ensure pharmaceutical products are not contaminated, which further then goes to ensure that we don't, we ensure patient safety. And ultimately, there's regulatory compliance uh, linked to all of these requirements. How do we do that in this instance and in when we're talking about air quality and clean rooms? We do this through monitoring and management of pressure relationships, temperature, humidity, air changes, air filtration, and lastly, particulate count. So what are the common standards uh, that, that we pay attention to and that we need to follow? So first, hospital-specific uh, ASHRAE standard 170 ventilation of healthcare facilities, and the Facility Guidelines Institute guidelines for healthcare facilities as well. Uh, these define a large array of ventilation requirements uh, across all spaces in the hospital, everything from a clean storage closet to a compounding pharmacy. And the one thing though is ASHRAE does not dig deeply into clean rooms. Uh, they do actually spend a lot more time on the other spaces in the hospital, but they reference you to USP 795, 797, and 800 for pharmaceutical compounding. Now these, met, these standards are not ventilation specific, but they each have a section, uh, section five, that discusses the actual air quality requirements for the space. Um, it should be noted that USP also covers everything else about pharmaceutical compounding, how you handle the drugs, how you, um, what, what you have to do for gowning, many things like that. We're not going to talk through that today. We'll concentrate on the air quality side. USP actually further then references ISO 14644-1, which defines clean rooms and the associated controlled environments with them. 
So there's a, a tiered system here. Um, ISO can stand on its own. Obviously, uh, many people use this to define clean rooms, but I wanted to make it clear that each one of these references the next. Uh, now, all of these kind of pile up to provide a couple of accreditations and licensing. Um, one is the Joint Commission International, which is ASHRAE. So they certify and accredit uh, facilities to meet the ASHRAE and Facility Guidelines Institute standards. Uh, this is a very common one actually in the States uh, and also uh, around the world at this point. Now, ISO certifications, again, that's, that is an international standard, very, very common clean room standard. They certify your clean room uh, twice a year. Um, and then lastly, uh, GMP certification. So a lot of times if you have an actual facility that's manufacturing any kind of pharmaceutical, which we won't touch too much in this presentation, but if you are manufacturing something and it's being distributed, you'll have to meet GMP. And occasionally you will see a pharmaceutical compounding pharmacy that attempts to meet these standards as well. Um, since it provides a fantastic additional safeguard for your patients and your process. So let's dig into the requirements. Um, there is a lot to unpack here. So first, I want to talk about the USP standards. Um, we're going to kind of concentrate on them for the most part, and we need to understand a few terms that are key. The first is a PEC, which is the primary engineering control. This is the actual place where the, the drug is compounded. So this could be a fume hood or a biosafety cabinet. Um, there's also what's called a pharmaceutical isolator. There's a few different options here, depending upon what you're doing and your requirements. And then there's a secondary engineering control. This ultimately is the space the PEC is placed in. So this would be the room that you're actually doing the um, compounding in. In SCA, so this is a segregated compounding area. This is what we'll talk about. This is an unclassified SCA. So ultimately, this means it doesn't have an ISO classification, but it has basically like minimum cleanliness requirements and it has to be segregated in particular ways from certain types of hospital um, uh, utilities. So you can't have it one near actual heavy utilities, you can't have it near a bathroom. It has to have actual doors that segregate it from any um, adjacent spaces. It can't be like an open pharmacy. And then ultimately you have a CPEC, CSEC, and CSCA, which is a containment variance of these. Uh, the difference is containment variants are used for hazardous and the regular variant is used for non-hazardous. Um, one second, my... Uh, Uh, requirements for compounding pharmacies, though, are based on a couple of things. So they're segregated in some different categories. The first one is the compound category. Uh, and then the next is the hazardous drug risk level, and then whether it's sterile or non-sterile. Um, an important note here is compound category and hazardous risk level are the, the category one changed recently. Uh, USP 797 used to use high, low, and medium risk, but not from a hazard perspective. It was high, low, and medium like to the patient and for the, uh, uh, the, the use date. They've recently changed that to this category one and category two CSP, but USP 800 has maintained the high, low, and medium because obviously that's based more on how hazardous the um, actual compound is. So, um, here is a quick breakdown of the standards. So USB 795 is basically a standard pharmacy. There's almost no real requirements on that. Um, th those, no PEC, no SEC, no anti-room, no, no ISO class requirements. Generally, just you're gonna end up with, you know, uh, ventilation for staff comfort. Uh, USB 797 is non-hazardous compounds and it covers sterile versions mostly. Uh, the 795 is the non-sterile version of that. They require a PEC of ISO class 5 or better. Um, I will note here that almost every requirement you see here is a minimum requirement. You can always exceed these requirements and obviously everyone would recommend that you do whatever is, uh, your, is possible. 
Uh, and then the SEC is an unclassified SCA, but there's no ant, which means there's also no ante room. Uh, if you get into category two CSPs, you have to have a class five with a class seven SEC and an ISO class eight ante room. And I think I accidentally left that asterisk there. So please ignore that. And it, uh, another note is you may never actually see this unclassified SCA because a lot of times places do both cat one and cat two in the same place. So usually when you do that, you just have to follow the CAT2 requirements. Now, if you have hazardous drugs, uh, you have to now look at whether they're sterile or non-sterile and whether it's a high, low, or medium risk. Um, for high, and, high, low, and medium hazardous, you have to have an ISO class 5 PEC, but then you can have either an ISO class 7 for high risk uh, sterile drugs, or you can have an unclassified CSCA for the low and medium. Now, one unique thing here is when you have the ante room for high hazardous has to be class seven. Um, so keep that in mind. Lastly, if you have low, medium or high hazardous non-sterile, you can use a class one BSC uh, and they don't really specify the SEC for this. So what's going on here is mostly you're using your PEC to manage the hazardous material uh, and then you're doing your other requirements or kind of linked to sterility. All right. All right. Oh, so sorry. One thing I want to touch on here actually is for your high hazard sterile, um, because you also have these negative pressure relationships, you have this ISO class clean, seven clean room is to help ensure you're not pulling uh, particles in through the clean room, right? So an ISO class eight would have a higher particle count. So they increase the particle count here to help minimize that impact on the sterile environment. All right, so first we'll talk about the details of the actual uh, relationships and measurements that have to be managed uh, for non-hazardous. So again, we noted that non-sterile, there's not really any major requirements. It's all about staff comfort for temp and humidity. Um, for sterile compounding pharmacies for CAT1, you do have to maintain temp and humidity. Uh, they do not specify an ACH requirement and monitoring is only required for temp and humidity. For CAT2, um, you have to have a class seven uh, requirement as we noted, and you have a positive relationship. So one thing we should make clear Non-hazardous facilities are going to have a positive relationship for sterile compounding because you're trying to keep all particles out. When you have a hazardous material, you're going to have a negative relationship, which then means that you're keeping the particles in. You're keeping those hazardous particles from contaminating the rest of the hospital. So the pressure differential is 2.5 to 7.5 pascals. Uh, again, kind of standard temp and humidity. Uh, notes about the temp and humidity is that these standards are to help limit viable particulate growth, so bacteria and other live organisms growing in the facility. Uh, a minimum ACH of four, and then temp humidity and DP being measured. Lastly, here we've noted the ante room requirement because you do have to have an ante room for the CAT2 uh, sterile. Uh, it's basically the same as the actual main space, except for it's class eight, and you don't have to manage temp and humidity in that space, but you do have a very large ACH requirement. And I just realized that the four here should actually be 30. This got uh, accidentally uh, left in there. That should be 30 ACH. All right. Brett, can we have a poll here? Oh yeah, I apologize, Abe, I missed our polls. Do you wanna go with the first one, I think? Yeah. We'll just give everyone one, everyone one more minute to answer the poll. 
think we have just a little over 50%. All right, fantastic. So it looks like most of us know a little bit about this and a few maybe are uh, experts. So um, we appreciate all of you joining us. All right, let's talk about hazardous compounding pharmacies. So we'll start with sterile being the uh, highest requirements. So again, these are very similar to the previous slide, right? Um, the ACH are very high because these are clean room spaces. Uh, they have negative pressure relationships still. Even if you have an unclassified CSCA for hazardous, you still need to have a negative uh, pressure relationship. Otherwise, you cannot guarantee that those hazardous materials are staying in but they do just not require you to have quite the extreme end. Um, Non-sterile, again, uh, they're not specified on the ISO class. The requirements for pressure and temperature and humidity are all very similar. Uh, the sterile clean room here, again, we noted is a class seven, uh, and you do have to monitor the DP for that. Now, in this instance, there's a couple of unique spaces. Um, hazardous material storage comes up here. The primary requirement here is just to have a negative uh, pressurization of the adjacent space, no specific requirement on the differential, and a minimum of 12 ACH is required. Now, on HD receiving areas, this is a note because if you do not receive your materials in the same PEC, or, sorry, SEC, SEC, then you have to have a dedicated space with a negative pressure differential to the adjacent spaces. So if you do, if your process requires you to unpackage and receive that within your standard space, then you don't have to have this. But if not, then you do need a separate space. Um, and lastly, we're not going to dig into this one because it's not really defined by USP and it's, it's arguable exactly where it lands, but ASHRAE does identify uh, nuclear medicine laboratories, and we do know that that exists in a number of hospitals. Um, they're negative. They're negative space. Uh, their temperature requirements are limited, and they do require a uh, air changes per hour requirement and constant monitoring. Now, what you do for ISO class and everything else in these spaces is heavily dependent upon what you're actually doing in them. So that's usually left up to a much broader uh, risk assessment and process plan within the hospital. Uh, so some notes on ISO. We talked about how these step down from ASHRAE to USP to ISO. So this here is the primary requirements from for the ISO classes. You can see that seven and eight, you know, it's a tenfold difference. That's pretty much the standard here. And that they don't worry about the smaller particle sizes under a half a micron. Um, again, ISO 9 is just actually room air, so that would basically be, you know, like your SCA requirement. All right. These are just some uh, other spaces that may be present in a hospital. Um, they're not always, the first one there is what we've talked about primarily, but if you have like a teaching hospital or, you know, university hospital, uh, you may have some medical device spaces. Uh, these have higher ISO class requirements, and they do usually have a, a FDA 21 CFR Part 11 requirement. Um, industrial doesn't really happen there, but we left it here for a reference, just kind of see where things stack up. Uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing, if you're doing like full manufacturing with aseptic filling lines and 503B, um, again, you have FDA and 21 CFR Part 11. Not common, highly uncommon, almost never seen in a hospital. Uh, the other one, though, if you have a teaching facility, vivariums might be right, seen um, within your site as well. So there's just some additional spaces to consider. So let's uh, let's talk about a example. All right, so this is a hazardous compounding pharmacy with an ante room, um, a primary S an SEC, which the PEC would be in here up on the top and a hazardous storage space over on the right. Um, this space is showing an example of Cetra equipment that you could utilize to manage all of the requirements that we've talked about today. Um, everything from a velocity wand here up in the left for air changes per hour to a temp and humidity, high precision temp and humidity here, item number one, 
a particle counter. Um, so this particle counter can be used to constantly monitor particle counts within the facility. Now, this isn't viable particle counts, but it could be a leading indicator to a further problem. So if you see particle counts like slowly increasing over the day or maybe over two days, then you probably want to go in and double check if you haven't recently checked your viable particle count and verify because it seems like you may have a problem. So this is a great way to do a leading indicator on that. Um, this is a large environmental monitor we provide that can, pre rep can present all of the items that are being recorded here to the user locally and do alarming. And then we have our Cetra Light product, which does differential pressure across a single room as well. And then here on the right in blue is the uh, our SRF series wireless high precision tech and humidity. Item four here actually is a cloud hub that will actually transmit all of your data from this space up into the cloud and allow you to view it remotely on our SEMS platform, which we'll talk about briefly in a moment. Um, well, let's run through this one and then we do have one more poll. Um, so monitoring and reporting requirements by USP and ASHRAE and everyone are mostly manual. Um, for the most part, there's no automated reporting requirements. You do have to record temp and humidity daily. Um, you have to have continuously monitored pressure, but you do not have to actually record it other than daily. Um, viable particle counting, you have to have a plan for this to prove that it meets the risk levels of your facility. Uh, clean room certification then twice annually, right, where they check all of these things we just noted above as well as air velocity, HEPA filter integrity, dynamic airflow testing, and they verify the total particle counts. Now, the best practice is to automate most of these processes. So having continuous room and in-room monitoring and data storage for the key parameters, temp, humidity, differential pressure, particle counts. And then you can even add into that remote appliance monitoring. And another thing that's nice about this, another good best practice is to have local and remote audible visual alarms, especially on like room differential pressure and filters, right? If your filters are bad, then you probably don't have as clean of a room as you think you do. If your differential pressure goes out, then you're either contaminating your product or you're contaminating the space outside. Both are a huge problem. Uh, and then lastly, you know, tracking of non-viable particle counts can help with, as we noted, uh, identifying ahead of time an actual viable particle count issue. So why do this? Uh, again, ensuring patient safety is the number one thing in the hospital, right? So we absolutely have to do that. Uh, it increases the ease of your audit process. The auditing process can be a huge endeavor. And when you can show an auditor, hey, look, here's what our data has looked like for the last year, it makes that process a lot easier and that auditor have a lot more confidence in what you're doing. Um, again, being able to monitor this stuff in real time, remotely, in room, knowing what it is all the time can help you improve and guarantee product quality and yield. And then also automating can, can have daily labor savings, right? Going and actually recording all of this stuff, not a, it requires someone to actually go do it at least once a day. And most places like to do it twice a day. So they know at the beginning and end of the day that everything was in spec. They have to then put it on paper or into a system somewhere and someone has to go store that somewhere and make sure that it's managed. So there's labor savings here as well. And again, when you have remote monitoring or you have this continuous monitoring of all these parameters and you do have an excursion in, the, in your process, you have a yield problem, you have a quality problem, you have an easier time going back and tracing that. Hey, was that because our particle count was high? Was that because you know, the humidity was off a little bit and that compound was, was damaged somehow? I think, uh, we do have a poll here as well, Abe. Yeah, I'm reaching.
All right. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, responding to that. Looks like we have a lot of people using some automated solutions um, and a lot of people that are familiar with, with the manual effort that this takes as well. All right. Ooh. Let's talk now about some actual solutions that Cetra can provide you to, to help with all of this. So Cetra provides both sensing and monitoring solutions. Um, we provide differential pressure. Uh, transducers, which is our very, very original business. Uh, these are capacitive transducers. We also do humidity and temp, as we talked about, uh, multiple particle counting options, and we have an air velocity sensor as well. Now, ultimately, you want to display that and be able to do a little bit more with that. We also have room and environmental monitors. You see the flex here on the left and the light here on the right. Lastly, we have the SEMS platform at being displayed here in the bottom. What you're actually seeing here is it's displaying a continuous recording of multiple parameters in a space. So let's talk about a little more detail about those. So one of the most complicated ones is our monitor line. Uh, the monitor line consists of these four push the button there, major monitors uh, from the flex down to the light. So at the top, you have the flex, which can monitor up to three rooms, 18 different parameters, um, everything from pressure to humidity. Honestly, you can monitor any, you can put any parameter into flex that you can send it over the BACnet communication protocol. And then light is kind of the exact other end, right? It's an analog device. It does pressure only. It's cost effective. It, it, it provides a fantastic uh, ring, colored ring indication of alarm or alarm state, as well as an audible alarm. And in between, we have SRCM and SRPM, which are, you know, slightly more complicated version of a single DP, and then one that does two rooms with four parameters. So depending upon what your facility looks like, uh, you know, would depend on which monitor that you choose. And then we have the SEMS platform. So ultimately the SEMS platform is a cloud-based piece of software uh, with a small hub system that would be in your facility. They would collect all the data and you can actually display all of that data in the cloud and see if anything is alarming. You can set up alarms here to remotely uh, notify people. Um, now, sometimes a lot of buildings will have a complicated building management system that's handled purely by facilities. Um, and that's, those are fantastic and they do some of these similar things, but what they often don't do is they don't usually give access to maybe the team actually managing the pharmacy, the pharmacists or the team in the pharmacy. And this is a great solution for that. Um, as well as this is 21 CFR part 11 compliant. So if you do require that for FDA, uh, then this system can do that, which most building management systems do not. Uh, we do show our other products here. So just a note, the SEM system is actually what you see on the screen. These here are all our other products that are feeding it. So just a, a kind of review of our products and where you would apply them. Uh, here you see the compounding pharmacy and all of the requirements you would put in the specific, the main pharmacy space, uh, a light for the ante room, a light and a temperature and humidity for the storage spaces, and then SEMS again to monitor the entire space all at once and give you remote access. So what's next? Um, identifying all your compounding spaces. You probably already have done this, uh, or if you're doing a new facility, maybe you haven't yet. Uh, identifying hazardous versus non-hazardous, sterile versus non-sterile. Uh, also along with this would be if you have category one or category two, um, CSPs in regards to the sterile side that are non-hazardous, um, and then evaluating your manual efforts required to monitor. These are fantastic opportunities for improvement, cost savings in the facility. Uh, while you're doing that, make sure you define any further expandability requirements. Are you going to have an additional pharmacy? Are you going to expand the size of that pharmacy? Is it going to be split into two sections? You don't have a hazardous side and a non-hazardous side potentially. Uh, next is to upgrade non-compliant spaces. You know, this obviously can require HVAC and control systems, uh, but it also may just be that you need to monitor better. You need, you know, a flex unit in there. You need a particle counter. Um, you need to get some, a better temp and humidity sensor. And then actually go out and upgrade compliant spaces that could benefit from more advanced monitoring, right? So maybe just adding the SEMS platform. Uh, and lastly, make sure you educate staff and use of new monitoring solutions. Uh, we've seen situations where 
monitors or new tools like this have been put in and then you find out the staff is very confused by them because the, the education on them just wasn't quite there. Um, and so we, we really suggest you make sure you have like either a little training manual or even an on-site training, like, hey, this is a monitor, here's how it works, here's what you do and don't do with it, this is what it tells you, um, because that's usually very, very helpful to people using on a daily basis. All right, and I think that's it for me. I think Rabia is gonna close us out and then we'll take all of your questions. Um, I appreciate everybody holding their questions and we've kind of been ignoring some of them I can see, but uh, we'll answer those in a moment. Thank you so much, Bryce. Um, we, we do have on the topic of the compounding pharmacies some really good references across the region. We do have multiple installations in Saudi Arabia with the Ministry of Health and with the King Saud Medical City. We also have some compounding pharmacy installations across the UAE. We are working on other projects across the region and the rest of the GCC countries as well as outside. Uh, we also have a, uh, an excellent installed base and understanding of the healthcare facilities, different critical environments across the board, and we would be more than happy to help you out with any requirements you might be having. We'll be opening up the door for questions. Uh, I see Wasim having a question. If you can type it on the questions box, And also we have the door open to anybody with a question or inquiry regarding the code, regarding the best practices and anything related to compounding pharmacies. As we wait to some of our customers to uh, type in their questions, Bryce, a quick question for you. So how often do you see compounding pharmacies across uh, healthcare facilities in the US? Is it exclusive to cancer treatment focused facilities or we see it across the board with multiple hospitals? No, in the States, we see them in most hospitals, even if it's only a small hospital, uh, um, I mean, a small facility uh, for just doing like simple drugs. Uh, compounding pharmacies, you know, can cover uh, a few different things, right? I mean, sometimes this is just mixing a unique formulation of a couple of drugs together because a patient has an allergy or something uh, to all the way to, you know, chemotherapy uh, medication that's very patient specific. Um, so we see it in most of our hospital spaces. I think some of the only ones we don't see is like, you know, kind of some of the more rural spaces that are less common, but um, very, very common in the States. Okay, very interesting. So here we have a poll regarding the number of compounding pharmacies across the hospitals with our clients in the Middle East and the overwhelming majority has one with a few exceptions having more, two or more as well as uh, also a small exception having none of compounding pharmacies. All righty, very interesting. Uh, we do have the question from Wasim regarding the citralite and can we calibrate citralite on site? Ah, that is a good question. So the citralite does have a zero calibration capability on site, so you can set the zero. Uh, we do not have at the moment a version of the central light that you can actually you know use a pressure calibrator on to verify and validate now there are some ways to do that if you wanted to um, but it's not explicitly set up for that purpose so um, but it does the zero calibration usually covers most people's uh, requirement for pretty extended period of time okay and I to confirm to everyone we can do calibration, field calibration on, on all of our room pressure monitors with the exception of light at the moment. Yes, that is true. Another question from Wasim as well uh, regarding having a, uh, 
an NIST traceable calibration certificate with the Citralite? All of our monitors come with a NIST certification, a certificate standard. So the answer is yes, they come with them. The standard price includes that. Perfect. We have another question from Satish Kumar, and it is regarding Citraflex versus Citralite. What's the key differences between these two products? All right, let me just go back and I'll just show those two products real quick because I think that, that that's the easiest way to answer this. So um, the Flex, we consider to be an environmental monitor, right? So the Flex is a much more complex unit. It has a seven inch touch screen. Um, you can use that. It's a backnet communication device. You can represent 18 different environmental parameters. Um, and it does can have an onboard or external pressure transducer. Light is a simple but easy to understand with uh, display, uh, but it's just a single DP, single differential pressure sensor, and it has an analog output. So it's kind of a big range there between the two. Um, you know, their purposes are different, and often actually what we see is a light paired with a flex, like for a compounding pharmacy, right? So you'll have um, I actually, we have one I was at recently, they would have, they had flex on the outside of the compounding pharmacy and they had light on most of the adjoining spaces internally to say a storage space, or they actually had, uh, then they had flex as well into the hazardous space. So then they can report all the parameters from the hazardous space into the one flex and display those in one place. If that doesn't answer your question, uh, feel free to further you know, elaborate. Yeah, and we have a question also from Satish Kumar regarding the calibration certificate validity period for the sensors and the monitors that we have. Is there a validity on the Cal certs? That is a good question. You know, there is not a set validity on those. Um, these sensors are uh, capacitive transducers. Uh, drift is not a significant concern or issue with them. Uh, generally, they, you know, the coming out of Cal is due to some kind of uh, incident or issue where, say, somehow the spaces became highly overpressurized and it actually can damage it or you know it gets physically manhandled so we i will double check on that and make sure we don't have a specific period but i would say that there's not a particular period um it's it's really not really a major problem um but we do understand that facilities require uh, recal in the field so i will verify or validation periodically so i will verify that for you and rabia can you help me make sure we get that question answered sure for, for, so. i'll be in touch with you satish uh, as we get the feedback from bryce yeah i'll verify that we also have a question from khalid al sharahidi this is maybe related to CSSD, Central Sterile Service Department within a hospital, and it is regarding air circulation between the three different areas, the sterile, the clean, and the dirty area, and can it be controlled by one flex or not? Oh, so that's a great question. Um, and so I'm gonna concentrate on the controlled concept. So our products generally are just for monitoring. Um, the Flex does have a control capability, but it would not be sufficient to control your air circulation uh, facility for a CSSD. Uh, there's too many, it would require too many outputs, and Flex only has a single control output. Usually, our monitors are paired with a larger, you know, company's control uh, unit and use ours for the monitoring side, so the data input, and then there's a controller separate. So okay, the short answer is no, 
Flex does have a control capability for very, very simple applications. But at the same time, we can monitor the three areas on one, oh, on one Flex, Absolutely, right? the Flex can easily monitor, that's a good point, Rabia, they can easily monitor all of the requirements you would have in your CSSD. I, I'm trying to even think of something, I'm trying to put together a scenario where your CSSD would have more requirements than the Flex can handle, and, and I really can't think of one. And it, an important note too about the Flex in that regard, if you do have more than three rooms, you the, the Flex ha is set up as a three room because it's three different screens. Each room has a different screen. You can slide between the screens. There are ways to set it up to do more rooms. So if you do have more rooms, don't shy away from the Flex. Talk to us and we can help you talk through options to do that. Excellent. Uh, we also have another question from Wasim, which is the SRPM can be on-site calibrated or not? Yes, absolutely. Yep. So just to reiterate uh, to, to our audience, only Citra light cannot be currently field calibrated. All other room pressure monitors, they can be field calibrated in addition to having the zero uh, adjustment. Yes. Thanks for the question, Wasim. All righty. Um, any other questions from our audience regarding compounding, regarding full automation of compounding pharmacies, the USP standard? Happy to answer other questions about uh, you know spaces with these kinds of requirements in the hospital. Now, if anyone has them as well, we have a couple minutes still, so. We're happy to do that as well. We'll give the audience another minute. Yeah, so we have a question from Al Hassan Al Khadr. Mm. Is there any type of central monitoring uh, system to control AOX fan? to increase the pressure due to blockage of the HEPA filters or any necessary to increase the air volume? So, so that's a great question. Uh, the Flex would be able to help with this. So the Flex does have a single control output that you could link to a condition on the monitor and do this. So you could, in theory, um, monitor that HEPA filter DP using a flex monitor and then have that trigger a auxiliary fan through the flex. And maybe to elaborate a little bit more to the audience, that could be accomplished using the analog output on the flex via the PI loop that is embedded with the control version of the flex, right, Bryce? Exactly. And we have another question by Sunil re regarding what standards Citra product comply with. Okay. So um, this is kind of a this can be a very broad question, and I'll try not to get too all over the place. But uh, so we do provide IP ratings for our products. So uh, most of the products are IP54. And then when you get into more regulatory compliance, uh, most of our products are CE and CSA compliant. There are a couple of exceptions there and you would, we would just have to talk through that. And you know, sometimes there's things that we can do to accommodate that. And they're usually UL listed too. I can't think of a product right off the top of my head that's not UL listed. Okay, thank you. Another question from Wasim. Uh, asking, is it a must to install the DP monitor inside the clean room or it can be installed in the corridor? Um, I will just going to go back to our example just to talk to that. Um, it, it can be installed in either, in most, in all cases, actually. Uh, we actually recommend they be installed outside the clean room. This one, this example here is kind of extreme where we're giving 
the team, you know, full access to the flex monitor inside. But normally we would see like the light out here on the outside. Can you guys actually see my cursor, Rubia? Yeah, yeah, I can see your cursor. Um, and like this light over here would be outside on this wall here. Um, so you can put it in either place, actually. Uh, if you are purchasing sets of light, please make sure you let your, or your sales manager know where you're installing it. Uh, there is a specific indicator in the part number, whether you're putting it inside or outside the, the room. For all other monitors, no, you can put them in either location. It doesn't matter. That's up to you. Let's elaborate to, to the uh, audience here regarding the inside and outside version of the light. What difference does it have? So the light utilizes a reference port for zero, for well, for the reference side of your DP. You can kind of see it in this image here. There's like a little like dot here. And so if you are going to put it inside the room, but you're measuring the pressure reversed, usually the pressure is measured in comparison to the outside space, right? Um, so if you're putting the light inside the room, we have to do some work to flip which side is the reference port and which side is the high side pressure port. Interesting. Thanks, Bryce. We have another question by Sunil. Can such a devices be connected to air conditioner controller? That is a question I think I'd have to understand a little better. Um, if you're talking about like, I, I'm trying, I'm going to use some brands like a Train or Siemens or a Schneider, like base controller for your ventilation system, they can usually be connected to that. And then they can feed in through that controller into your building management system software and overall system. If you're asking about a specific controller attached to a specific air conditioning unit, that uh, I, we would have to really sit down and dig into that with you, I think. Um, we would need a lot of details on that, on that application. So I think Sunil reiterated that a controller takes the data and makes the correction. So I would assume that it would be like a building management system controller. Yeah. So I think the answer there is yes. Uh, and you're talking about, yeah, like a larger part, a controller that's part of the larger system that can go out and say, you know, change this uh, fan, change that fan, adjust this VAVE. Uh, yes, we absolutely, it can be connected to that. That is a major part of all of our DP and monitoring products uh, requirements, right? So. Yeah, and we, we offer a backnet on uh, the majority of the monitors that we resell for easy integration. Right, we have a couple of questions by Wasim as well. Um, one, one is, is it a must to have the DP monitor to be flush mounted? That is actually a really good question. Now, it depends on what application we're talking about and it depends upon what people, some of the other ratings on the products. Uh, in a lot of cases, like in facilities where they do wash down, like pharmaceutical manufacturing, the actual facility requires it to be flush mounted. And that's because one, they can guarantee usually an IP rating and they can wash down the whole space. And when I say must, that's not necessarily defined by us or the full regulation, it's defined by the requirements of that facility and the quality team there. Um, the, sorry, we're answering the flush mounted, correct? So the, the short answer is no, and especially in like compounding pharmacies, you can go, you don't have to be flush mounted. Um, the SRPM is not flush mounted. The other three devices we presented are flush mount, um, but no, you do not have to for compounding pharmacies. And same with many of the other spaces in a hospital. Um, often preferred though. Okay, thank you, Bryce. And here, Wasim is elaborating a little bit as he wasn't able to offer the set for light for a clean room project he was working on due to the fact it was not field calibratable. So he proposed our MR series for DP measurement and display. 
and uh, he got a rejection because it wasn't flush mounted. Mm. Yeah, was that for, I, I guess, let's see, is that a, I'm curious about the application so that we know about that requirement, um, but I would say then, you know, the requirement, it seems like you probably have a low cost flush mount requirement, which would mean your next, best option from us would be the uh, SRCM, which may not meet your price point. Um, yeah, I, I'm not, uh, Rabia, are you familiar with the MR1 series? I'm not as familiar with that series. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know it. Um, it. It is not a monitor per se, uh, but I think maybe here the SRCM and the SRIM series could, could be a potential option for a flush mount uh, to meet the flush mount regulations and to be able to withstand washdowns as maybe alternatives to the light with the ability to be field calibratable. Yeah, we didn't talk about the SRIM. Um, it's a little bit older product, uh, but it does have some unique applications like this that are that is very useful. So I think Wasim, for your, uh, you know, we're happy to help you with this. So I would highly recommend reaching out to Rabia and. and uh, getting a discussion started, and I think we can probably help you find some solutions. We'll be in touch with Wasim, definitely. Okay, allocating here a last one or two minutes for any of the audience, if they have any further questions. And I believe we have not seen any further questions in the questions tab. Yeah, Wasim as well. Another question from Wasim. Is there any plan to have stainless steel boom DP monitor? There are discussions. Uh, yes, there's discussions about options for that. Um, I, we do have the SRIM monitors that come that way. So again, I think that's a, a good discussion for us to have, Wasim. Uh, they do come in a stainless variant. Uh, the newer versions, there are there are discussions about that. But I can't say when that would or wouldn't happen at this time. Good question. Alrighty, one last minute for a question. 